very warm welcome to all of you once again for joining uh, this event, which is an exclusive event, uh, webinar series uh, for New Simlaya exclusive webinar series as a continuation of our previous series that we have done throughout the year. This will be one of the most exciting and uh, meaningful program, which I believe will be of great benefit to all the audience. So um, without further delay, I'd like to first and foremost welcome all of you and thank you to all of you for spending your time this afternoon with us. Uh, I'm Collins Chong from the Marketing and Recruitment Center of New Simulaya. And um, before we start the session, allow me to announce some of the uh, housekeeping announcements for a smooth session here for all of us. So please, first of all, mute your microphone and uh, please do not click any button before and uh, during the webinar session as this will be recorded. And uh, so this webinar session will be divided into two main segments, which will be the main talk itself, uh, followed by the Q&A session, which will be moderated by myself uh, in, in accordance to the uh, questions that will be raised by the audience. And uh, kindly note that the audience is encouraged to ask questions during the Q&A session after the talk is over. So um, we also appreciate that you will be able to share your feedback with us at the end of the session. And uh, without further ado, this is the um, culmination of um, very, you know, a lot of efforts have been put in for this event. So let me introduce our honorable guest speaker for today. It's our honor to have her with us and none other than the Deputy Dean for Undergraduate Studies for Faculty Medicine, world renowned Faculty of Medicine, New Simlaya. And uh, it's my honor also to uh, read her profile to all of you. So Professor Dato Dr. Yang Farida Abdul Aziz, she is the Deputy Dean for Undergraduate for Faculty of Medicine, New Simlaya. And uh, she is an academic professor and a consultant radiologist at the Faculty of Medicine, New Simlaya. She, re she received her undergraduate and postgraduate training at the New Simlaya. And uh, she underwent a clinical attachment in cardiac imaging in the United States of America in 2000 and 2001. She completed the essential skills in medical education course and received the ESME Certificate in Medical Education in 2019. She is an alumnus of the IDC program organized by the German Academic Exchange Service, DAAD, focusing on training academics on higher education and change management. Over the years, she has honed her skills in the academic, professional clinical service, and administrative endeavors. As a consultant radiologist, she provides clinical services at the Museum layer teaching hospital known as the UMMC or New Simlaya Medical Center, as well as the New Simlaya Specialist Center, UMSC. And she was also instrumental in setting up the cardiac imaging services utilizing CT and MRI. As an academic, she is involved in developing, implementing and ensuring the quality improvement of the undergraduate and postgraduate radiology programs at the New Simlaya and she has been trusted with numerous roles and responsibilities, including as a member of the Malaysian Medical Council since 2017, and as Deputy Dean of the Undergraduate Affairs at the Faculty of Medicine Museum Malaya since 2015. She continues to dream passionately, and, and she has embraced the art of seeking knowledge, and she remains curious and uh, creating different possibilities in her career and her life. So it is our honor once again to have her with us for today's event. Without further delay, I would like to, with utmost respect, pass over to Prof. Dr. Yang Farida for her exclusive sharing session with all of us. So please welcome uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Yang Farida. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Colin, for that, um, well, um, quite an extensive presentation or uh, introduction to me. Um, first of all, before we start, um, I would urge all participants to try and log into polef.com on another browser. And once you have done that, this is for audience participation site. Um, just under the joint presentation, just make sure you insert uh, Yang Farida A022 um, in, you know, um, in to replace the username and just click join. If you can then create a screen name for yourself, 
then you will be able to participate in some of the polls that I will be sharing with you today. So I will just give you a few more minutes to do that. Remember, go to polev.com on another browser or another tab and uh, insert Yang Farida A022 under the username and click join. Okay, right, so I will begin my presentation now. So the title of today's uh, talk is on the journey to becoming a doctor. As mentioned by Colin, Colin my name is Yang Farida Abdul Aziz. I am a professor at University of Malaya and currently a deputy dean for the undergraduate studies and the consultant radiologist for the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. And also mentioned by Colin, I am actually a thoroughbred of this university. I did my MBBS degree in University of Malaya. I also did my postgraduate clinical master's at University of Malaya. So if anyone were to be able to tell you the experiences or the journey of becoming a doctor at University of Malaya, I would be one of the person that should be telling you this. So first of all, we'll be going to the first poll. I just want to see, I just want to be able to find out. Oops. I was told that I did not share my screen, so I will do that first. Okay, share. All right, um, so if you could uh, please uh, join on this survey, go to paulf.com and type Yang Farida A022. Um, and uh, I'll be able to see, we'll be able to see the responses. So far, I've only have one person saying they're from Malaysia. If we can get more participants to join into the survey, Yes, thank you. From China, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> they pulled out. <laughs> Would you, do you, are you able to see the survey? You're able to see it on the screen? I have to share this. Okay, wait. Uh, Yes. Okay. So I have to switch every time. So it's just the same. So okay. Sorry for the technical difficulty. We're trying to do this survey. So if um if you can hear me, could you answer this survey where you're from, uh, by going into pollapp.com and typing Yang Farida A022 under your, the username. Thank you. We have someone from Indonesia. They keep on um, pulling out. <laughs> People keep on pulling out. I only have one from Malaysia. Yes. So I may have to conclude that I only have one person from Malaysia listening to this talk. Okay, no biggie. Maybe we can do that later. Any, so I'm gonna stop sharing now because we don't seem to be having any response. Someone from Thailand, they're getting used to doing this maybe, yeah? So as I've mentioned, pollapp.com, yangfarida A022. Okay, so that's fine. So I'm going to go back to the presentation.
So would have been nice if I could have known where you guys are from, but no biggie. Let's continue. So I've done this presentation in, um, in which I would like to share with you some of the things that I would have wanted to know before I chose medicine. So I would uh, want to, I would have liked it if somebody were to tell me some of these things. So I've decided, I've divided it into before on, let's discuss on why, on the choice of your career, um, and who are the people that will be suitable in terms of personality of attitude uh, to do medicine. Um, I would then talk about again before, where would you like to study, which university of choice, um, and during, I would want to discuss with you on what will you be studying, that would mean program structure, and how do you um, continue to study and to make sure that you graduate um, as a doctor, and I'll be talking a little bit on sustaining enthusiasm. During and after session, I would continue with the how in terms of building resilience, and I will end with where, basically, once you have ended, where do you go from then, yeah, from here. So this is another poll which I will share the second screen. So, so I do want to, so I've activated this um, survey, this poll. If you can respond at polleb.com, Yang Farida A022, on why do you choose to do medicine? Great, we're getting some people responding. Depending on how many people respond, you will see the differences in the response. Great, great. So we're seeing, we're seeing people, uh, Okay, so now it's been locked. So if you were, from what you can see, why do you choose to do medicine? A lot of people, 45% mentioned that you want to help people because it's a noble profession. And definitely a lot of people feel that that's why they want to do. 28% thinks it is exciting. And I agree with you, it is exciting. 15% have not made that choice. So they're keeping their options open. Uh, 3% uh, says they are inspired by a TV show or a movie. And you know what? That was why I did medicine. Actually, uh, just my own personal journey. I actually did medicine because I was inspired by a TV show. Not any TV show that you all will know now because that was many years ago. So there was a TV show called Quincy M.E. in which um, it's an American TV show. Uh, he's a doctor, he's a medical examiner, and he would perform autopsies. And from the clues from the autopsy, he will then solve the crime. So for me, that was really exciting. He's a doctor, and yet at the same time, he's solving uh, clues and puzzle. And so the Nancy Drew in me really, really, really loved that. So I, that was why I decided to be a doctor. And I was at that time, maybe about 14 or 15 years old. So, so even if you do it because of TV show or, for example, and inspired by a real life doctor I know, who is my role model, I think that that's great if that's what you want to do. And very noble this, country needs more doctors. And I think that is also very important because in a way you are looking at capacity building. Uh, but in the end, a lot of people go into medicine because they think it's a noble profession and definitely it is a noble profession. So I'm going to now go back to my presentation.
so we we had the poll so why do you choose to be a doctor sometimes it's family yes family is urging you to be a doctor and i have to admit um usually when it is the family or your parents that are kind of uh, nudging you or maybe heavily pushing you towards medicine you are going to find it very tough to complete the the the, the program because it was never what you wanted to do right you you can you because most of you are going to be very clever you will be able to do it you will be able to get into the program but because your heart is not in it you're going to find it very difficult to get through it because it is a tough tough program and it is also a tough profession it is some people do it because it's a noble profession definitely i think who who do not want to help people but at the same time nowadays you know that there are many many ways to help people you do not have to be a doctor to help uh people you can be an advocate you can do social service many many ways to help people so be very clear that when you say you want to do it because you want to help people and it's a noble profession that you understand that you have to put your heart into it and your kind of put your life into it as well so if you don't want to do this long term then choose other ways of helping people inspired by tv i've talked about this i myself fell into this category um that you think is a good job prospect and actually it is it's good job prospect in the beginning in the beginning it may not be but actually by the time you are a consultant like me you're a specialist like me you do actually have good job prospect and it does pay well some in some countries it pays very very well uh, compared to other countries perhaps yeah nations capacity building i think that's very very important uh because sometimes if a nation does not have enough doctors or specialists then you are making sure that your people are helped and it is not just um helping people on to one to one basis it is also building policies making sure that your health policies are the best or best there is and some people do it because they've had good role models and definitely this is also important however i do want to remind you all that you need to always see the big picture because being a doctor a healthcare professional is a lifestyle if you choose this be prepared that this is a lifestyle it is not something you can leave at work and not think about it this is a lifestyle that is with you 24 hours a day 7 days a week and that is a commitment that you have to know and to choose so who are suitable to be doctors um first i want to discuss with you the entrance criteria in university at university malaya we need at least 12 years of pre university education you need to have strong academic performance in biology chemistry math or physics and english and when i say strong academic performance i mean a and above um you will have to go through an entrance examination and you will have to go through an interview process before we admit you into the program and we know that medicine everywhere is a very very competitive program to know more and in detail about this i would suggest that you go to our um website under admissions where all the different processes that you need to know as well as how to apply is put there um a little bit on the entrance examination we actually do a biomedical admissions test called bmat malaysia this year we will run it online and this is actually a test in three sections Uh, that measures aptitude and skills scientific knowledge and applications as well as a writing task and the timing for this are shown here and the types of questions are shown here again you can go to medsen.um.edu.my.bmat if you actually go to the um website it can take you to this website as well and this next year will be the bmat malaysia 
we will be running it in sometime in February. So if you are interested, please register. Registration is going to open soon. So please go to the website. Um, and if you were to type BMAT under Google um, and go to BMAT UK, there are actually test questions that you can practice on uh, in preparation for this entrance examination. In terms of interview, previously when we could do face-to-face -face interview, we used to run it as a multiple mini interviews. What are these? These are conducted for candidates who wish to apply for MBBS. And we basically want to see your demonstration of non-cognitive characteristics such as giving instruction, re receiving instruction, emotional communication, pro problem solving. We want to test you on resilience and maturity, your enthusiasm for medicine, ethics, as well as awareness of common issues in medicine. However, due to COVID, we will not be able to do this face-to-face. -face, so interviews uh, will be conducted online for next year's intake. So there is another poll that I just want to do quickly. So I'm going to activate it. So what personality traits should medical students have? And this is something that you just have to type and answer. You need to type, not there's no, uh, not for you to choose from anything. I'm opening it to you to decide what traits you think a medical student should have. Yes, resilient, definitely, I totally agree. Responsible, yes. Patience, yes, definitely patience. Leadership, communication, teamwork, fantastic. So the larger it is, that means a lot more of you all have answered this, yeah? This is very good. So a lot of you think responsibility is important. Some put a thinker, definitely humble. Yes, definitely. Um, enthusiasm, yes. And someone put bravery. And I think that's, that's very interesting, yes. Confident, perseverance, fantastic. So responsible is something that somebody has put a lot so i'm just going to lock it good somebody has put radiology that's interesting <laughs> that's what i do that's not a trait that i should have okay so if you were to look at this a lot of people have thought responsible being responsible is important passion having passion is important you need to persevere you need to be persistent teamwork commitment Somebody has put feet, so I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> okay, care. And I think love, yeah? Determination, all fantastic answers. And I, very, I agree with you all that we do need all these um, traits. These are very important traits. And I think you agree with me that these are the traits that you need to have to be a doctor. Yes. And I hope some of you already have those traits, yeah? So, so we've talked about the entrance criteria here. We talk about the personality traits and some of this you all have, have said in the poll. You know what? This is not exhaustive. Some of the things that you have put on the poll would be something that I would also want to put on this. So, but I've just put some of it, discipline, driven, compassionate, yeah, um, having empathy, adaptable. Now, this is an important trait to have now, especially in this day and age of COVID-19. And I find that being adaptable means that you're able to move with change and adapt yourself to a, a very difficult situation. And that is something that a medical doctor needs to be. Selfless, of course, accountable and responsible. This comes to hand in hand having integrity, being a team player, humble, yes? So if you are not sure, right? If you're not sure that you are suitable to be a doctor, I would suggest you take a career aptitude test. There are so many online. Do that to know the kind of person that you are. And I want to also say that it is important that you don't romanticize medicine. 
medicine is tough medicine is difficult medicine is a difficult journey don't make it into a romantic thing because when you do that your expectation of it being exciting and romantic and romantic in a dramatic fashion is not going to be met and you're going to have difficulty um, finishing the program be passionate be determined have your enthusiasm but at the same time really be grounded in reality and that's how you can get through a medical program okay and uh, we will talk more about this later on so we've talked about choice of career and suitable personality and attitude let's now go to which university should you go for if you decided that medicine is the one for you you've done an aptitude test you really want to choose which university you go for so we are going to talk about that a little bit under which yeah so that's going to be another poll let's do another poll i'm going to activate it this poll is on ranking please rank what do you look for in a university education and to rank it according to your priority okay so we're seeing 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 a lot of things i'll give it a few more minutes Okay, so I'm going to lock this. Thank you very much for responding. So number one, a lot of you decided that high quality teaching is very important. And I think, yes, that would be the thing that you have to, that would ensure that you are competent. When you come out, you are competent as a doctor. That's very important. Ranking and academic reputation, definitely, because, you know, a university that is ranked will then have to maintain and ensure their academic reputation. And therefore, they will make sure that this is, um, this is something that is important to the university. Good student experience in terms of diversity, community, accommodation, facilities, definitely very, very important. Cost, I am surprised that it is number four, but yes, so uh, this goes with this generation. So I'm happy to see that to you, if it is good enough, you will, you will not think of the cost so much, although, of course, it's still a priority. Employability is number five. And I'm not, again, I'm not surprised because actually, if you have, an, if you have a doc, doctor degree, you are uh, with an MBBS, your employability is kind of, uh, definitely you're going to be employed because you will need to serve the nation. And location is not a, a important thing for the, the people that have shared uh, their views today. Okay, uh, let's go back to the presentation. So now University of Malaya is at the cusp of Kuala Lumpur, which is a metropolitan a bustling um, um, city with diverse cultures, yeah? And in terms of ranking, we are in the top 60 QS World University ranking. We are in the top 50 by subject, uh, top 50 in the um, Asia University ranking, THE, Asia uh, University ranking. We are in the top 50 as a green matrix World University. And uh, in terms of uh, QS Asia ranking, we are in the top 20. And in terms of in Malaysia, we are the first ranked university and the oldest university in Malaysia. Um, this is the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. It is the oldest faculty in University of Malaya. Our vision is to be a center of excellence in medicine. And the mission is to provide excellent healthcare, education and research programs delivered with efficiency, sensitivity, and enthusiasm. 
we started out as King Edward the Seventh College of Medicine, founded in 1905 in then Malaya, um, and this was in Singapore. It later became University of Malaya in Singapore. However, by in uh, around 19 late 1950s, um, there is a division between uh, you know, University of Malaya moved to Kuala Lumpur and became University of Malaya. Um, in Kuala Lumpur. So we have a Kuala Lumpur campus established in 1959 and the teaching hospital, University Hospital was opened in 1968. So now, so when the division happened, University Malaya came to Kuala Lumpur and the previous campus in Singapore is now known as University of National University of Singapore, who is still very much our sister university. Now, there are different programs that we do in, at the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, we have MBBS program that is five years, a Bachelor of Nursing Science, four-year program, and a four-year Bachelor of Biomedical Science. However, today I will be focusing only on the MBBS. In terms of intake for 2020-2021, uh, we accepted 173 students into our MBBS program. 18 into our Bachelor of Nursing Science and 57 into the Bachelor of Biomedical Science. In terms of our human resource and facilities, we have a, huge, a big uh, faculty strength in which in terms of academic staff, there are 549 lecturers that will be there to teach you uh, in this program, out of which 402 are clinical academics like me, meaning that I also serve as a doctor or as a physician, and 147 are preclinical academics, and these are the anatomists, physiologists, some of our bio, uh, bio you know, uh, my, microbiologists, and so on and so forth. Out of that, 107 are professors, 136 are associate professors, and we have 288 senior lecturers at the faculty. We, as I've mentioned, we have a teaching hospital that is focused in, in making sure we teach um, our trainees to be competent. And this is called the University of Malaya Medical Center. It is a very large uh, university hospital. It is the first and best teaching hospital in Malaysia. It has 1,600 1,600 beds and it covers all specialty and it also has a very vibrant clinical investigation center. Um, we, have, um, we have facilities at the faculty such as the Cube for teaching and learning. Um, when you enter, there will of course be a guidebook for you and uh, we have a very, very well-stocked library uh, that ensures that we have the latest um, journals and articles for you to peruse, and this can all be done online. And we have moved to e-learning very, very quickly, because, especially because of the pandemic. So at UM, we are prepared to teach e-learning using platforms such as Spectrum. Uh, we use Microsoft Teams. We use YouTube to put um, uh, YouTube, uh, especially for the Faculty of Medicine, in which the lectures, the voiceover lectures are put on YouTube for you to listen at your own time. We also have a platform called Lecturio in which additional lectures, additional interactive sessions, additional videos on procedures are put in and you can access that as well. And we have a um, um, database uh, such as Journal of New England Journal of Medicine, BMJ Best Practice, and Elsevier, Elsevier that has uh, articles that are suitable for medical students. Um, in terms of student empowerment activities, um, our students do a, quite a number of activities through the medical society and some of them are things like Organs for Love in which we had a drive, donation drive to get more organ, organ donors. 
uh, genes for genes in which we had a drive to uh, create awareness for genetic disorders. And ERASE is our annual um, drive to create awareness and to eradicate AIDS and stigma for AIDS. And this is called ERASE. Ranking and research, as we mentioned, we are number 59 in World University Ranking, QS, 13 in QS Ranking in Asia, 43 in THE World Ranking, and we are 34 in terms of green metrics. And in terms of university, as I mentioned, University Malaya is the first and top university. Um, it is situated on a 312 acre campus in southwest of Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we have a broad based research and we are government supported, a large faculty member, a large student population, the largest and best teaching hospital and, uh, and a very, very vibrant research culture. In terms of Faculty of Medicine, our research thrust areas are infectious diseases and immunity, cancer and drug discovery, aging and regenerative medicine, and public health and non-communicable diseases. And our students are encouraged very much and are guided in research and they, they present at conferences, um, uh, put up posters at conferences, and we are very, very proud of uh, our final year medical student, Subhashan Fadibet Bella, who has been selected as the Rhodes Scholar Elect 2021 for Malaysia and will be uh, the recipient for the Rhodes Scholarship um, at University of Oxford. So um, these are the caliber of students that we have at the faculty and we are very proud of them. In terms of student support, we do um, care for our students. So we do have welfare project, our support for our students, as well as counselling services for students uh, to help them out should they need counselling. And we are also very big. Um, currently, uh, UMMC, University of Medical Centre, is a COVID hospital. So our students are taught to protect themselves um, by the usual measures of um, declaring health, uh, health, uh, declare your health status by wearing masks, social distancing, perform hand hygiene, as well as face hygiene. So now we're going to go through the segment in which we will talk about the program structure as well as on sustaining enthusiasm. So now let's talk about medical curriculum and I just want to make a comparison between a previous traditional curriculum and current medical curriculum. And I'm not just talking about uh, at University of Malaya. This is usually the kind of thing that's happening the world over. So previous medical curricula that has continued to evolve and adapt. Previously, medical program is traditional, is subject-based, it is taught in silo, uh, there's late clinic exposure. The lecturers are taught to be sage on stage, just telling students what you need to know and with not much feedback or to read communication. And a lot of the teaching happens in a, in a tutorial session. However, current medical curriculum are not integrated. That, um, what I mean by that is you, when you learn previously in a traditional sense, the curriculum was like you learn anatomy of the whole body, you learn physiology of the whole body, but now it is integrated in the sense that you are taught cardiovascular system where the anatomy and physiology and the clinical uh, findings and, um, and physical findings of the heart is integrated into a block. So it is now no longer subject-based, it is system-based. We have a multidisciplinary approach where different, different uh, expert, experts come together to teach you in a cohesive, um, integrated way. We have early clinical exposure as soon as you enter in year one, we will already expose you to patients and you will be brought into a clinical um, environment. It is now no longer stage on stage, student-centered. You drive the learning, you drive your own learning. And instead of a tutorial, we do an applied science approach in which we do either problem, 
team, case-based learning or clinical reasoning. But what have not changed over the years? Medicine remains as a mixture of science, humanities and social sciences, and the content, the practice of evidence-based medicine and importance of clinical pathophysiological correlation in which we need you to connect the dots between all these different, different aspects of human, those are unchanged and remain the same. So in UM, we practice outcome-based education and competency-based education. Outcome-based is not a new concept. It focuses on the graduates rather than the process in which learning outcomes are clearly stated and explicitly communicated to you, the students, to the teachers, as well as stakeholders. What about competency-based education? This is a trajectory, this is a base in which, this is the kind of education in which we expect your competency to move from being a novice to expert level, and this trajectory of expertise that you need to master, we can carve it from your undergraduate days, and you continue to build on it up to when you become postgraduate learners, as well as beyond when you are specialists. And this would mean that there will be entrustable learning activities that will, you will be expected to fulfill to prove your competency. So outcome-based education is adopted by regulating and accrediting bodies in most countries, including UK, US, Canada, Australia, and Malaysia. So um, our uh, quality of the program, of our medical program is governed by the Malaysian Qualifi Qualification Agency, and they have outlined uh, the learning outcome domains in eight domains as shown here. And we at University of Malaya Faculty of Medicine interpret those educational outcomes in which at the end of the program, our students should be able to fulfill all eight of the domains domains outcome. So at Faculty of Medicine, our aspiration is to advance health through integration of education, excellent clinical care and research. And how do we do this? Through a five-year course that occurs in three stages and has four themes. So we actually have less didactic teaching, we expand small group teaching, we now teach in system block, we enhance clinical skills teaching module. You have early clinical exposure and four themes. What are these themes? They are the basic and clinical sciences theme, the patient doctor theme, the population medicine theme, and the professional and personal development team. And these are what we expect the students to demonstrate at the end of the five-year program. I will not go through this in detail, but just to show you that for every theme, we have an outcome. We want our graduates to be able to demonstrate these abilities, right? For example, in patient doctor, you need to um, demonstrate ethical behavior. You'll be able to elicit and interpret clinical symptoms, so on and so forth. For population medicine, uh, this is very much like what COVID is now. It affects the whole population. So you should be able to evaluate the distribution and risk factors for disease and injury and employ prevention practices. Yeah, we, we want to make sure that we prevent disease rather than treat. Yeah, prevention, primary prevention is always what we go for. And we want you all to learn to use evidence-based, ethical, and uh, economically responsible decisions in terms of um, when, you, when you deal with a population health problem. And for personal professional development, you need to show commitment, compassionate, ethical, professional behavior, perform as a member of a team, as well as show leadership. You make rational and sensitive decision based on best available evidence. You recognize the patient's personal, physical, and emotional needs. You show commitment to advancement of learning, and you uh, must be able to record, organize, and ma manage information with appropriate use of information technology. So these are the, the details of the different subjects that you will be doing. 
within the five years in stage one, this is year one, you will be doing language and medicine, a foundation block, and you will go through the different um, um, blocks such as musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, as well as respiratory. In year two, you move to hematology, neurosciences, endocrine and sexual health, renal and urology, gastroenterology, oncology and palliative care, as well as uh, one week of radiology. And in third year, the third and fourth and fifth year, this is where you go to full clinical exposure. You will have rotations in this different posting. Each rotation is eight weeks. So you will be rotated to medicine, pediatric surgery, IENT, and after that, you will have an elective. Following that, in year four, you will be rotated through obstetric and gynecology, psychological medicine, acute care, acute care which, uh, in which you are exposed to anesthesiology and emergency medicine, orthopedic surgery, and community health. And finally, final year, you revisit medicine, pediatric surgery, as well as primary care. Following that, you will then do a two months pre-internship. And this is very important because uh, the pre-internship, you become shadow intern or shadow houseman. And that will ensure that, that your shift to going to work as actually houseman becomes um, seamless. Yeah, And through all that, the four themes are, are basically the themes are across the five years of medicine. So the University of Malaya experience, what are the competencies that we are looking at? We want you to be able to take a history and perform physical examination. Again, this list is not exhaustive. I picked some of the ones that we I wanted to share with you. You need to be able to recommend, interpret diagnostic tests. You need to prioritize differential diagnosis in patient. You need to be able to outline treatment and management plan. You need to be able to give multiple oral presentations of clinical encounters to your colleagues, to your supervisors, to your attending doctors, to your consultants. And this can happen either at the bedside, um, whether it is at the clinical skills lab or whether it is in a, a formal presentation, but you will be expected to be able to talk and use appropriate medical words when you are talking to your healthcare counterparts. You need to recognize patients requiring urgent care, you need to be able to obtain informed, informed consent and work in an interprofessional team. What happens then? On the job, you need to make sure that you uh, maintain good attendance and attitude, uh, maintain professional ethical behavior, you will be expected to go on call. You will be expected to uh, perform and uh, keep a logbook that will be assessed. You will have to perform procedural skills of a doctor, such as blood taking, catheter insertion, delivering deliveries of babies. And that will be what you'll be expected to do. You will have to perform workplace-based assessment. So I'm just going to try and see whether people are still with me and go to another poll. So based on what I've showed you, very little that I've showed you, I would like to uh, get your response on this. Okay, very good. So a majority of you feel that it's exciting. So I'm very happy that you feel that it's exciting because um, I think this gives you an idea what you are dealing with. And I hope that's what I get to do today. Um, some of you felt that it was as, as you expected it to be. And that's good because then you will manage your expectation very well. 
Some felt that it's tough, but it will be doable. Yes, and I think it is very true. And I fall under this category, actually, as a medical student. I don't think I was very, I, I probably I did not expect it, but I adapt very quickly. And I, I, there were some moments that were tough, but I tell myself that this is doable. And in the end, um, and it became that way because that's what I tell myself, yeah. Um, you, most of you feel that it is comprehensive. 3% feel that it is not comprehensive enough, and that is fine for you to feel that way. 5% feel that it is exhaustive. And yes, I do agree that it can be exhaustive at times. So I'm going to stop sharing this and go back to my presentation. So if you want to look at the University of Malaya uh, experience in terms of cons, I do think that it is an exhaustive program, especially if you do this alone. If you expect to do a um, MBBS program alone, you're going to find it very, very difficult. Yeah, Because as I mentioned, medicine is a lifestyle. So once you enter a medical program, you are committing to a change in your lifestyle that your life is not going to be your own anymore. There's going to be frequent assessments. In, in clinical years, every time you finish a posting, you will be tested in an end of posting examination. And that can be exhausting. There are no long breaks. Um, when you come to University of Malaya, you're going to have friends maybe from other faculties that do other programs, and they get their semester break you don't get the semester break. Right? There's no long breaks because we are training you to how it's going to be, how life is going to be as a doctor. So some of you might feel burnt out. Therefore, you need stamina because you can't really switch off. Yeah, You can't really switch off 100%. But I do advise you to try and switch off. What about the pros? If you do it at UM, you because of the university hospital, you have access to the best teaching tool, which is which are the real life patients that you get to teach, you get to I mean that you get to talk to, you get to practice on. You have access to teachers who are practicing professionals. So they are both academics, they are they are teachers, at the same time, they are also doctors. So when they teach you, it is an up-to-date knowledge transfer to you. You are, although you need stamina, you will be able to unwind because of UM campus, the facilities and its location. UM has a beautiful lake. You can run around the lake. And just outside of UM, there will be a transport for you to go into the city. And uh, it is a very, very diverse campus. So you'd be able to find, make friends and unwind. Yeah? Um, and you know what is this about medicine that I realized? When to enter, it is difficult. I have to be the best, one of the best to enter the program. But once you enter the program, you actually do not have to be brilliant. Of course, we have brilliant people like Subhashen who got the way, uh, the Rhodes Scholar. But you actually don't have to be brilliant to do medicine. You have to be disciplined. You have to do the work. You just have to be hardworking, but not brilliant. So that's a, a, a good thing, I think. But what it tells you, though, that you need to learn to sustain enthusiasm because you don't want to be burnt out and lose your passion for medicine. So you need to learn to sustain enthusiasm and you need to learn to build resilience. And you guys are going to be the tomorrow's doctors but you are now going to be the today students and you're the generation Z. Now, we at the faculty, we have to look at all these things. Who are the generation Z? That's most of you are this. You are born after 1996 and you have been, it has been said that you are very self-directed people. You like to do things alone, self-reliant here. Right, even though you like personal relationships, you um, prefer to learn at your own pace. Apparently, you are socially very good, you're very connected, socially responsible. You want to create an impact, you are very concerned about world uh, problems. Yeah, 
So you are very concerned about that. So that, that's the generation that you come in. You are the original digital natives. Basically, you were born in a world where there's already digital technology. You never knew a time when there was no digital technology. But that, while it is very good because you're very technology savvy, it also creates problem because um, you are easily distracted. Uh, your life's your attention span is only about eight seconds, apparently I was told, and, uh, and, and you can multitask across five screens. I, so in terms of doing medicine, some of these are very good. However, um, medicine, you need to be focused. So that might you, some of you might need to shift and learn to learn to be focused. However, you are a generation that's going to be heavily educated and that's very good as well. So, so how are we as the education provider? We need to ensure, how do we ensure that your generation achieve the program outcome? Okay, and that's a question that we always ask ourselves. So I'm going to do another poll I need you to fill in the blank for this. The best way to get my focus during a learning activity would be, and please fill in the blank, what would it be? What would you need uh, to be able to keep your focus? Um, life interaction, okay, yes. Uh, however, life interaction would not be something that you can happen, it cannot happen all the time, yeah? Listening to music while doing things. Okay, that's good. That's good. Remove distractions. Okay, very good. Interesting hands-on experiment. Yes. You have to stay disconnected. Switch off all my gadgets. Very good. Keep the mobile phone away. No, that's difficult because I'm presenting and I still have my phone. Face-to-face, -face, comprehensive, simplify. Yes. Meditate, fantastic. Music, yes. Creative learning and teaching. Drinking water, that's interesting. <laughs> Silence. Oh, well, that's interesting as well. Interesting teaching materials presented. Hands-on opportunity. So you're going to get that when you do, when you do medicine, yeah? Because the hands-on in medicine is very important. However, there's also going to be a lot of, the, the thing is, there's a lot of knowledge that's going to be imparted to you, yeah? That needs to be imparted to you. And a lot of times it's difficult to impart it in an interactive, uh, interactive manner, right? And sometimes it is very difficult to make sure that you keep your focus for long, it's difficult. So yeah, caffeine, definitely, I would agree. So I'm gonna stop um, this, uh, this now, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you very much for those who shared, uh, who shared their, their thoughts on that. So as I said, we at the faculty, we are very concerned because while we know that we have all this knowledge to impart to you, at the same time, we want to be able to tap how you gather knowledge. What is it that makes you focus? What is it that will make the knowledge course into you, right? So because these are the things that we need to impart to you. In, within it all, inside it all, what we want to train you is to have the proper personal attributes. That is to be self-directed learners, to be ethical, responsible in your actions, to be reflective practitioner. And then on the outer layer, we want you to have interactional abilities such as be effective communicators, have be able to work in a team, and uh, covering all that what helps you to be all those are uh, to have applied knowledge and skills and that is to ensure that you have basic and clinical sciences knowledge uh, knowledge on social aspects of health knowledge on patient assessment and management so how do we do this so some of the things that we have seen that might help in generation x for them to learn is to ensure that we do it through innovative teaching to be technology driven 
to ensure that you have experiential learning, that it is not just by the book, it is, like you said, hands-on learning, that it is student-centered and in small group learning, that you have mentors and role models that you can look up to, that it is flexible, that we give you feedback and we ensure that you have entrepreneur programs to teach you on health economics and that, that there is societal impact in the curriculum. So our approach at the faculty is to do some of these things and it's already there in terms of uh, student needs. We have ours is an outcome-based curriculum where all the program outcome, educational outcome, learning outcome and course outcome are explicit explicitly stated. We have moved to innovative learning where teaching where we have e-learning in which we do flipped classroom, blended, we intersperse didactic with interactive sessions. Technology driven, as I've mentioned to you, you saw this, that we have all this. And in terms of YouTube, apparently 70% of medical students learn from YouTube. And we have also got on board with that. Um, experiential learning, uh, not just hands-on at the hospital and with the patients, we also um, expect you to do reflection exercises during the program and we, ex we give, we deliver most, we deliver our uh, teaching in big group lectures, but most times it is in student-centered small group teaching, uh, such as uh, problem-based learning, team-based learning and scenario-based. We have a mentor mentee system uh, to help you with creating a uh, mentor and having role models. We give feedback and we also receive feedback of the key teaching activities. Um, we have the population medicine team to take care of the societal impact. We have an entrepreneur program in the UM Student Holistic Empowerment Program. And for the short attention span and prefers to work independently, we uh, tend to in include quizzes, games, one minute papers and self-directed learning in our program. Now, what is self-directed learning? Now, to be a medical student, I think, or to be any student, it is important that you own your learning. There is a gap between how you've been taught before and as you come into university, there is a gap in how you're being taught you are expected to drive your own learning. You need to take ownership of your own learning. You have to make sure you know what are your gaps. You set your own goals. You have to extend your own learning beyond the curriculum. You need to be empowered. You need to manage and monitor your own learning. You generate your own inquiry. You do the reflection. You do your own feedback, yeah? Or use feedback to adjust your learning. And because of that, you need to develop skills of self-directed learners. That means you have to acquire the positive habits of self-directed learners. You have to develop healthy coping strategies and you have to ensure healthcare. Some of the positive habits, learn for yourself. Remember I was talking to you about your choice, how if you do it for your family, it's going to be difficult for you because you do not have the intrinsic motivation to do this. So learn for yourself. This is very, very important. Healthy coping strategies, you need to have activities to release stress. You need to be able to release bottled, bottled emotions. It's very important that you don't keep your emotions bottled because that leads to unhealthy self-care. And you need to practice mindfulness. In terms of self-care, it's not just physical. It is also psychological self-care that you have to look into look after your own psychological self and seek support. Know when you need to seek support and do so should you get into trouble. And what we also have to be aware of in our own curriculum is that there's a big shift in AI, as you can see now that in future, everybody's been talking about this, will we have robots? Um, attending to us as doctors. Well, already we have AI, we have robotic surgery, we have telecommunication, telemedicine communication, virtual nursing, computer-aided diagnosis and clinical judgment and image analysis are already here, are already here. Now, so should, should, then, should you all then decide, I'm not going to do medicine then, 
where's my career trajectory? What's the point if uh, robots can uh, take over doctors? Well, let me tell you this. They are not going to take over being a doctor because in the end, all these are tools that we use. Yeah? Tools that we use to help our patients and to come up with a diagnosis because the robots, they don't make errors. They don't make mistakes. What else we do as humans? But at the same time, we are able to assess all the information that they give us and come up with the best treatment for the patients because we will be looking at the patient as a holistic manner where else a robot will not be able to do that or even an AI will not be able to do that. And if you just think about it, whenever you, uh, you know, when you do phone banking, I don't know about you, but it frustrates me because I want to talk to someone and patients will feel the same. They would want to talk to someone. So that someone have got to be a real life doctor rather than a robot. So because of that, I do not think that robots and AI will take over or replace doctors. But what does it mean for our curriculum? Future curriculum will have to teach our medical students to humanize medicine, right? To know what are health informatics, to embrace technology, and all the more soft skills in which we teach you to, to work in a team, to network, to be good communicators, all those now become very, very important because what you need to be are doctors that don't just show detached concern, but you need to be doctors that really empathize with your patient. And those are aspects in the curriculum that we have to ensure that you all are trained in and are competent in. So, um, we've just, we've talked about program structure. I'm just gonna talk now about sustaining enthusiasm. Some tips and tricks to sustain enthusiasm Sometimes we forget when we are tired, why would you want to choose medicine in the first place? So don't forget, every once in a while, you need to light the fire in your belly. A lot of these tips and tricks are in your mind, and you have to make sure that you bring it out every time that you need it. So you need to remember to light the fire in your belly. You need to remember that you must be curious and remain curious throughout your program, the medical program. And this is the journey that I had to go through and I would like to impart to you. I learned it without anybody telling me. So I hope that I'm, you know, that's why I would like to share this with you. I did not learn this, uh, but this is good. You need to know your learning style and you have to use it to your advantage. Uh, you need to mix it up you know, and many people uh, have a mix of learning styles, but you need to know your learning styles and also know how best to learn. And they do this. There are, um, there are websites that can help you do this. Some of them are these websites. And I think uh, uh, we will be able to share these websites with you. So you can go through these websites and learn what type of learner you are. And these are the different types of learning style, either you're a verbal learner, spatial visual learner, whether you're auditory musical learner, and you've seen some of your, the participants saying that they need music when they learn, and you're obviously, then you are obviously an auditory musical learner. Some are physical learners, some are very logical learners, and all of you are either interpersonal learner in which you learn best in groups, or you are a solitary learner in which you learn best working alone. However, in medicine, I have mentioned to you, while you can do this, but you cannot do this all the time, there will be times when you will have to be a social learner because that's where you learn communication skills and you learn to work in a team and you learn tolerance. Another tip and tricks, have your strategies. You have to create harmonizing, harmonious learning environment. Some people were saying they need calm, they need caffeine, they need everything to be quiet and um, you create that on your own. You need to be optimistic. Even as, as down as you feel, you need to get yourself up and always keep that streak of optimism in you. Brainstorm is a very good way of learning. Uh, mind map, speed reading, you need to take schedule breaks, yeah? And 
as I mentioned, one of the self-directed learning habits would be to practice reflection and feedback, and that allows you to adjust your learning. And of course, you need to polish your soft skill in teamwork and leadership. Communication is key. You need to study with your friends, learn from them, teach them, and you need to learn and enjoy the art of talking to patients, patients' relatives, nurses, attendants, lecturers, consultant, administrators, so on and so forth. And that is very important. Communication is very important if you want to be a medical student. And you need to be inspired by good role models and mentors. And that is something that you need to actively seek um, when you uh, do a medical program. During and after, I want to talk a little bit on building resilience and I will end to uh, where do you go from here. Now, Malaysia has been over the years, over the last two years, been uh, troubled with this, in which we have too many medical graduates and they are not prepared for the life of medicine. In Malaysia, one in every five trainee doctors doing housemanship quit. And that is 20% of people quitting the medical profession. And the main reasons why this happened are number one, because they never did want to be a doctor in the first place. They were pressured by their parents to study medicine. They had a different perception of a doctor's life. Yeah, the, the, the expectation is this, but the reality is this, and they could not, the two could not meet or be reconciled. They were unable to work long hours and they suffer from burnouts. And these are some newspaper articles that we have from Malaysia and uh, of students struggling with medicine, uh, medical school, family issues and depression. Okay, bear in mind, this is not, this, I just have to put a disclaimer, this was not a student from University of Malaya. this was a student from another university, but I'm just saying that these are the, the, the issues that we are having now with medical doctors. And uh, you don't want to be in this statistic, so you have to really choose wisely, yeah? So what are the myths and what are some of the realities of medicine? So what are the myths, you know? They, your students think you're this nerd, your family thinks you're having a good time studying medicine. Society thinks that you're cool, like the doctors in Grey's Anatomy, right? The professors think that you're struggling, then they're always help, having to help you out. Yes, and you think that you want to be as clever as this doctor called, I think, in-house, this brilliant, brilliant doctor in-house. And what you really do is that you are bogged down with trying to work with, through the knowledge and all the practical skills that you need to have. What are the reality of medicine? Medicine is actually difficult if you see it only as a science and you're gonna have difficulty because it is not only a science. It's a mixture of art, science and social sciences skills and you need to learn the art of history, taking a physical examination. You need to nurture the ability to treat your patients with respect. Internship training is physically exhausting. I have never been as exhausted as I was when I did my housemanship. But you have to remember that it is a fleeting moment and it would not last forever. And it actually teaches me to function while being sleep deprived. And that's very important as a doctor. You need to be able to think while you're sleep, even though you're tired. It's very important. And you are not the only people that have to do this. Your parents probably did that when you were infants, yeah? And it also fosters hard work, it fosters good experiences, and it fosters nerves of steel, which you need to, to be, to need to have as a doctor. It is emotionally draining housemanship. You are expected to be smart and organized while you're exhausted. And what is very important when you do, when you, when you go through even as a medical student and as you move on as a houseman, as well as when if let's say you become a medical officer, there are going to be bullies and you need to recognize them and endure them, but move on because you need to, what is more important is recognize those that genuinely want to make you a better doctor and you will be able to suss this out. So you, you, it's going to be difficult, 
in life, in anything you do, not just medicine, you're going to have bullies in, what, in whatever shape and form. But to be able to recognize the people that genuinely want you and to latch on them, that's very important for you to learn. So in terms of, and, and the reality of medicine is that in terms of time versus intensity, right? As a medical, as a houseman, you spend a lot of time at work in the beginning, but later on, you don't really have to spend that much time at work. Yeah, as you move from um, an intern to a consultant in terms of uh, time at work. In terms of time on call, you actually do a lot more time on call as a consultant. In terms of salary, you there is a nice gradient uh, of uh, uh, salary if you are in with the government, yeah, work with the government. But of course, if you are in private, as soon as you become a specialist, there's an steep upward curve of salary that you can um, get yeah, that you can get once you are a specialist and a consultant. But in terms of responsibility and accountability, you actually have very little as a houseman. But as you become consultant, you move through medical officer, specialist, consultant, your responsibility and accountability just goes high up. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you have to go through is the misconception versus reality. What's the misconception? You think that you are respected? Yes, you will be respected, but you need to earn it and you will not get it at a junior level. You think that you feel that everyone, especially patients, uh, will love you, but only for patients, they only love you if you empathize and talk to them. You feel that if you are good, you will be acknowledged for, for it. And you feel that perhaps if I'm a doctor, I will be happy and fulfilled. Hmm. In reality, it is actually a long road. As I mentioned, five years of medical school, plus four years if you want to do special, if you want to become a specialist, maybe another three years if you want to sub-specialize. So that's a long, hard road. Yeah? And it's hard work. The salary is not so great as I mentioned at first. You work very long hours until you don't have to as a consultant. And you think that you are acknowledged for being good, but actually no. Most of the time you are remembered for your mistakes. That's the reality. And there is a high, high level of responsibility and accountability. So this is where I want to talk about building resilience, not just as a medical student, but also as a doctor. There, you have to manage your expectations. This is your expectation, this is your re re reality, and there is, if there is a gap, it will create a problem, yeah? So these are gaps, when you have a gap, a too big gap between your expectation and your reality, you are going to suffer from frustration, anger, helplessness, burnout, and loss of interest, and you will then quit the medical program and you don't want to do that because it's a commitment, as I said. So you need to know that you can't control the surrounding, but you can control how you react to it. So what are some of methods that you can utilize to manage your expectations? You need to acknowledge right off the bat that medicine is messy and dirty. You need to focus on what you can control. And a lot of these things are, again, as I said, in your mind. It is in your mind. You need to train your mind to do this. You need to care for yourself and that's very, very important. You need to understand that it is okay to fail. Now, most of you that will enter medicine are the best. You are the best in the cohort of people applying for medicine because it is a very competitive program and you are used to being the best. And suddenly when you enter medicine, you find that you are failing and you cannot reconcile with it because how can I be from up there? How can I move from up there to down here and not understanding what is happening? You need to manage that expectation. You need to know that it is okay to fail. What is important is how you get up from that failure and move on. And this is again, it is in your mind. You need to be prepared for this. You need to know that you cannot know everything and therefore, that's where you need friends and colleagues and your lecturers to help you with this. You need to ask for help, learn to work in a team. You need to stay positive, yeah, that it is, that everything will be okay. 
having a positive mental attitude is asking how something can be done rather than saying it cannot be done. Yeah. So you need to find the optimistic viewpoint in a negative situation. You need to resist the temptation to take shortcuts because if you do that, then you will find that you will have trouble when you become a doctor. It is unethical to take shortcuts, especially in medicine. You should not take shortcuts. You need to distress, have a hobby or two, yeah? And uh, you need to manage your priority, know what is important and urgent versus what is not important, not urgent. And you need to keep your sense of humor and this is very important. But your journey continues, yeah? Your journey continues. Once you have finished a medical degree, you need to serve the nation as an intern where um, just like this chat here, I fell asleep all over the place when I was a houseman. You may decide to get married and have a family. You may decide to focus on your social responsibility efforts or you can join a postgraduate training course and be a specialist. And I would advise that you would you do this if you do, do take up medicine as a profession. And at University of Malaya, we have a number of clinical master's courses that last for four years. And um, so we, if you do come to University of Malaya to do medicine, we do want you to continue with our clinical master's courses, which was exactly what I did. But if you don't want to do medicine or you don't want to continue uh, clinical medicine, you have options. Remember that you have options. You can, you can do bioethics. You can do research. Just do pure research. You can be a clinician educator. You can work in policy, in policy uh, work in, as global health. You can do health system management and policy. You can do molecular and cellular research. You can actually work on quality improvement and patient safety or in urban and community health. And the list goes on and on. So it is not just one size fits all. So a little bit of my personal journey, how I got to where I am today. You know, the me today, who is the deputy dean of the Faculty of Medicine in, faculty, in University of Malaya, a lot of it has to do with age. You know, with age, you think better, you, you, you weigh your options better, and that has a lot to do with it. But I was also lucky because I found a supportive partner. I had very good mentors and role model. I learned very early to be a team worker, and I think that's very important. I find that I try very hard to be facilitative and not be obstructive, and that's very important as well. I am a very positive person. Um, it is not that I don't deal with reality. It is not that I don't understand that things are real and I still want to be positive, but it's just that overall, when I'm going through a difficult time, I always try to look for the silver lining. Very important, I see the big picture all the time. Sometimes when you're caught up with a problem, you can only see that problem. It is very important for you to take a step back and look at the big picture. And that's very, very important. So I, that's going to be, I think, another poll. That's, this is our last poll. I am going to ask you to do this last poll. Yes. Put a clear responses first. Okay. So if I can get some feedback that after this session, ah, convinced that medicine is for me or convinced that medicine is not for me, you are still undecided. Let's see what people say. Okay, fantastic. Majority feels that, oh no, a lot more are now undecided. Okay, good. Whatever your response is, I know I'm glad that at least, um, you know, I, I get that the undecided is difficult. That's about 30% of you are still undecided and that's fine. Take your time. I would advise those who are undecided to really, really take your time. And for the 6% that are convinced that medicine is not for you, that's good as well. I think that's very good to know early on that this is not what you want to do. And I'm glad that this session have 
kind of maybe open your eyes to what you, you know, maybe perhaps your myth, because of your previous myth, now you know the reality and you've decided that it's not for you. And that's a very important decision to make as well. Yeah. And for the 63%, I hope some of you will apply to do medicine at University of Malaya. I, am, I will welcome you with open arms and please go to the UM website to know the details of how to apply to University of Malaya. Okay. So I um, will be ending, uh, be ending my presentation very soon. And after that, we're gonna have a question and answer session. So I just want to share with you in my 32 years of my personal journey, I had to learn failure and how to overcome it. I learned to work for 36 hours straight when I was on call as a houseman and clocked 40 patients in a night. I learned to sleep while standing, yes. I did this in operation theatre. Um, I was not the one operating, I was the one holding the retractor, and while I was holding the retractor, I fell asleep. And this was at 4 a.m. in the morning. So I learned to sleep while standing. Very, very good, um, very good, uh, um, what do you call that? Very good uh, uh, ability to have, I would say. I would say. I learned not to take shortcuts because I actually did try to do shortcuts and I was called out for it and I was and I realized that I was not being responsible by doing that and I could have it could have been uh, um, traumatic for the patient but I was very lucky that the times that I took shortcuts um, it was only me that was embarrassed and it did not have any impact on the patient but that made me learn not to take shortcuts the only time that i take shortcuts is when i use waves and it tells me to take this um, shorter route i was made i made mistakes and was called on it so i learned to be accountable i was shouted at by superiors and patients and relatives i shouted at colleagues as well and other staff and housemen I was caught recalcitrant by the then Dean of Faculty of Medicine. I learned to manage my expectations. I learned to go back to work 14 days after delivery, after a cesarean section, because, you know, medicine is a lifestyle. I felt proud when my students became my colleague and excel and surpassed me. I learned to be a team player and leader. I learned to listen and I'm still learning. Another thing that I forgot to put here was that I learned, uh, I learned how it felt to cry when my first patient died and how traumatic it was. But I, I learned to uh, move on and, and to, to learn from my mistakes. Yeah? And you know, in the end, I would still, if you were to tell me, ask my 30, 32 years ago, I'd do this all over again. No question. Definitely. Very, very worthy. So with that, I thank you. Question and answer. Back to you, Colin. Thank you. Checking myself. Checking. Stop okay. I stop share. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. He has been uh, very enlightening. Uh, and I believe that the audience, the students have got a very meaningful and comprehensive uh, talk by you. It's a very insightful and uh, meaningful sharing session, which I believe will be of great benefit to the students. And uh, you have shared a lot based on your expertise, your experience, and uh, a lot of pep talks and this, uh, the, the, the enlightening the students on journey towards uh, becoming a doctor. So uh, I believe there's a great interest and from the last poll that we have seen, um, this uh, from your session, a lot of students have got this newfound uh, inspiration and aspiration and the passion to pursue their dreams for this noble profession of becoming a doctor and to serve mankind and humanity. So um, it is a great session, which we are all very thankful for. And um, for the Q&A session, we have got several questions from the audience which maybe I'll, I'll consolidate because some of that will be of uh, similar nature. And most of that will be uh, will uh, actually be on the requirements and the, the entry requirements for the MBBS program. 
and sure. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just direct them to you now. And first of all, will be the um, the the MWED band for the MBBS program, as well as the requirements for the SPM results and for those that are from the matriculation program. So maybe yeah. Prof can uh, enlighten yes. them. Uh, for MWED, yes, definitely we need MWED, but you know what? <laughs> I'm old. I really cannot remember exactly what band you need to be. I think it's band four, if I'm not mistaken. You need to have band four for MWET. And the question was STPM, SPM, matriculation. Was that it? Yeah, correct, Prof. So for matriculation, you need to have a CGPA of 3.8 and above. Okay. But, okay, let me, let me start first. Now for SPM, SPM, you need to have 5A minus, minimum 5A minus, and this 5A minus will have to be in these subjects, biology, chemistry, um, math, physics, and English. Okay, so you have to fulfill the SPM requirement first. Following that, for matriculation, you have, and as well as STPM, you have to have CGPA of 3.8 and above. Okay, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, sure, Prof. Band, band four, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, so, so for those who like to know in detail for the requirements for the MBBS program, you can always uh, uh, go through our website. We have the uh, full list of the uh, detailed requirements. We, we have it on our uh, digital version of our brochures and uh, for those who have other questions you can always email to us which we'll share with you the contact details later on so prof we have another question um, which um, he or she would like to know how they can balance the lifestyle as future ho's and mo's due to long working hours so that uh, it won't deter deteriorate their health as have been as what many doctors have been facing and is it common for doctors to venture into academic field uh, to escape from the very hectic hospital lifestyle. So okay. I'll, 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 I'll start with these two questions. Yeah. Let me answer the second one first. <laughs> uh, don't get me wrong. Huh? Um, there are some, okay, some universities in which the academics only do, not, actually I shouldn't use the word only, only, I'll take back. There are some academics that do teaching and curriculum development, okay? But at University Malaya though, because we have a teaching hospital and that answers one of the question that's in the chat box that asks whether UM has its own hospital, especially for residency, residency program. Yes, uh, we have our own teaching hospital. So at University Malaya, all the lecturers like me, we also give service. That means we have patients actively coming to the hospital. As I mentioned, we have a 1,600 bedded hospital and we have more than 1 million patients per year that comes in for treatment. And as a radiologist, for myself as a radiologist, I actually actively report on chest x-rays, on CT scans, on MRI even now. So um, for University Malaya, being an academic clinician would just means that I added my workload. So I teach and train at the same time, I give clinical service to patient and at the same time I have to do research. However, so most academics don't choose this to run away from clinical work. But there are some that do not have a teaching hospital in which the academics will choose, um, I mean, sorry, uh, doctors choose uh, clinic, uh, choose academic. And these would be, and these doctors that do that are doctors that feel that clinical work is not for them. So they will choose, um, they will choose to do, let's say, anatomy. They will choose to do physiology in which you will not see patients, yeah. They will choose to do microbiology, perhaps, yeah, and uh, so on and so forth. So those are options open for you, and you can be, uh, and you don't have to see patients much, yeah, but you're still involved in patient care and training and all that. The first, what was the... The, the first question would be on, on how, how to balance the lifestyle oh, of HOs and okay. 
you know what? Number one, when you have finished your medical school and you are a houseman, you need to put your life on hold for two years. You just need to put your life on hold. There will not be any work-life balance in that two years. Just That's why your expectation has to be managed. If you expect to have work-life balance and the reality is you don't have it, you can't. Then there's a gap and you're going to be very frustrated and burnt out. So don't have that expectation. Your, your work-life balance in this sense would mean that perhaps you take away, maybe you put like one hour or 30 minutes of your day in which you just de-stress and do something. But the rest of your time, you're on as a houseman. Let me tell you what I did. When I was a houseman, it was very grueling. I was on call every other day. Um, and that, therefore, life was, was within the three months that I did the posting. I only had one week of holiday. And uh, how I got through it was I like to read. My hobby is reading. I like to read fiction. So when I'm going through the day, what gets me through it, if I'm feeling really a bit down, I would say, it's okay. You will, can go back to the houseman quarters and read maybe one chapter. And that kept me, that you know, brought my spirit up. So if, I, if you think that you're going to go out, have fun, yes, you will have time to do that. But if you expect it to happen, like on a schedule, it's not going to happen. You can't have it. So please. If you want to do medicine, when you're doing housemanship, please don't expect to have a work-life balance. And that's how you get through it. Yeah? You were saying that then it will be unhealthy for you? No, it will not because you don't have expectation for it. You just make sure you eat well. You don't even have to bother. I mean, yes, you can exercise in the 30 minutes that you have free time, you can exercise. But you know, you'll be walking around the hospital so much that you probably don't even need um, you know, actual physical exercise unless you want to. So as long as you make sure that you remember to eat and eat well and keep your stamina up, don't let your mental, um, um, you know, thwarted expectation bring you down because that's the one that can make you feel very, very tired. So do not have that expectation of a work-life balance, not during housemanship. Later on, now I'm a consultant, I have very good work-life balance. So, you know, so you just have to hang in there. It's difficult in the beginning, but later on it will be good, yes. All right, uh, thank you, Prof. I'd like to draw your attention to another uh, set of yes. questions, which will be on the interview session, where uh, a lot of uh, students, they have been asking on the the process of the interview, whether how many students will be called for the interview, and how many, what, what will be the percentage of the uh, the, the, the prospects being being approved and uh, in, in light of the current pan pandemic so how will it be carried out uh, as a whole yes so um, um usually we called in about 400 to 500 students uh for the interview and around i would say maybe around one around 20 percent to 30 percent makes it through the interview so not not very high it's very very competitive and uh, so let's say we call 500 and our entrance is around 170. Yeah, so that's about 20%, I would think. Um, and uh, now because of the pandemic, we actually do online interview in which you are given questions for you to write an essay on uh, or a statement on and you will be expected to um, you know, do a video presentation of yourself, um, answering some of the questions that we give. We don't give you much time to do the video um, because we want the ideas to come from you. And from there, we are able to pick our students. Um, that's what we did because of the pandemic. Yes. Right. So uh, in, in relation to that, uh, we have this question where the, the qualities that the interviewers will be seeking on the interviewees on what are the aspects that they'll be looking into during the interview. Yeah, so I mentioned it just now, we look at your non-cognitive skills. So we want to see, because when we give the interview, the interview have got um, 
a question, you know, for you to respond to. We want to see how you, if you are able to receive the instruction, how you are able to give the instruction, how you are able to uh, think beyond the box on some of the things. Are you aware of some of the global health, um, uh, you know, aware of global health issues and some of the policies? We will also um, we will also test you on ethics. We will test you on ethics and the way you think. Yeah, the the way you the way you uh, think of ethics. Now, a lot of these questions that we ask you actually do not have a right or wrong answer. It doesn't have a right or wrong answer. It, but it does um, tell us your train of thoughts. We also have questions in which we we see whether you are resilient, whether you are judgmental, um, whether you have the maturity, accountability, and responsibility to do medicine, and the empathy to do medicine. So those are the qualities. I know it sounds exhausting like you have to be the saint to do it but in actual fact most people are good most people do want to be good uh, but we want to pick those people that can show us that they have these qualities in terms of how they answer the question yeah right thank you prof so so about on, on the bmat scores and they have been asking whether to what extent uh and role that they play in, in affecting the selection of the students BMAT, it is one of the entrance criteria. So you have to get a good score of BMAT. Unfortunately, every year people ask us, what's the good score? We do not have a cut off good score. It depends on the cohort taking the BMAT. Very much like your, it's very much like your, you know, um, you, you know about grading on a curve. I'm sure you've heard about it. That, um, that, um, um, when you grade on a curve, it means that for that particular cohort, depending on how you answer, depending on the questions that are asked that year, and depending on how it's been answered, um, you might have people doing, a majority of people doing very well, or maybe the next year, a majority of people not doing so well. So there is no cut off point for BMAT, so I will not be able to answer you that question, answer that question for you. However, I can tell you that BMAT is counted we use it to select our students. So please, I urge you to go to BMAT, uh, the UK site, and practice on the questions there. And what BMAT UK does every year is that previous, um, previous papers, they will just release it on the website. So please do look at it and practice it if you are very serious about trying to get into medicine in the simulator. Yes. Right. So, Prof, on the on the aspect of scholarships, uh, whether there are any scholarships available for international students for this program, as well as the the notion that uh, only students with GPA scholarships are uh, eligible for the uh, admission uh, criteria. So maybe you can uh, attend them. Not at all. Not at all. Um, in terms of scholarship. Um, I know that University of Malaya have some scholarships available, but Faculty of Medicine definitely do not have any scholarships available. So you would generally have to find your own funding and know it is not true. In fact, when we select students, we actually do not know whether they have funding or not. We just select them based on our own criteria, which is the strong academic performance, your BMAT scores, and your interview scores. And that's how we choose uh, you. We have no, we do not look at whether you are financially able to handle this or not. That would not be a question that I can answer. Right, so I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, limit uh, to another two more questions before end of session. One will be on the research studies. So what is meant by research studies in UM? And can they proceed without going through housemanship? Uh, research studies, uh, your, yeah, okay. If you, I would say if you've already done medicine, uh, as, uh, if you've already done medicine, you should do your housemanship. If you don't want to do your housemanship, in Malaysia at least, you can ask not to do your housemanship. You actually have to ask the Malaysian Medical Council for exception. And if you don't want to do your housemanship, say you decide not to do your housemanship and you want to do research, that's 
fine as well. However, if you were to do that and you work in government, like University of Malaya, you will not get the clinical allowance given to medical doctors. So you have to be aware of that. But that's a, definitely an option open for you. You can go into research and you don't have to do housemanship if you go into research. Right. So I think uh, the one last question would be, is it possible to become jobless, although we have finished the whole course as well as the internship? So what they can do about it if they... Yes, yes it is possible that you become jobless in Malaysia. I'm just talking about Malaysia because now medical officers are contract post. It is no longer a post tetap. Uh, tetap means permanent post um, with the Ministry of uh, Ministry of Health, it is possible that you will become jobless. We are working very hard to make sure that does not happen. Uh, we at, particularly at Faculty of Medicine University of Malaya, we are looking at our own funding and trying to find our own avenues to help out. But of course, we will not be able to help out everyone uh, that graduate from our system. We are also working with policymakers and Ministry of Health to try and solve this problem. We are working with um, Malaysian Medical Council, of which I'm one of the member, to, uh, to also solve this problem. Um, I think it is a problem that can be solved if we reduce the number of students taken in to do medicine. Um, but at the moment, if you were to ask me, the answer would be, it is possible for you to not have a job when you um, when you are a medical officer after your internship. Yes, it is possible. So prepare yourself during your internship. Prepare yourself to, to try to think about what you're going to do next in your future. I would advise do a, a, do a, a postgraduate study. Yeah. Right. So uh, thank you very much, Prof. Yang, and uh, we will be ending our session. And thank you very much for your very uh, meaningful sharing session, I believe it will lead to a new dawn of uh, awakening for students to to have finally you know um, found the, the right steps ahead for them and to chart new frontiers for their own future and to most importantly to ensure that they have got all this uh, you know knowledge experience sharing session uh, from from you especially and and i believe it will be of great help to all of them and um, before we end the session i would like maybe to give the last words to you, Prof. Any final advice, maybe the most, the single most important uh, advice that you give to all aspiring students who have these long held dreams of becoming a doctor and what would be the most important first step that they can take now? Okay, I would just say, even if you don't get to ask your question, do email me, I will answer your email, I tend to answer email, so you can email me at any time. I would say, do it because you want to do it. Do it for the patients, your future patients. And do it with an open heart. But most of all, please manage your expectations because that's the best thing you can do for yourself. Okay, so, but I wish you all the best. And um, lastly, I do want to say that if you decide and commit into medicine and make it your lifestyle, you will not regret it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Dr. Yang Farida Abdulaziz for the very meaningful, comprehensive sharing session. And uh, before we end, uh, of course, uh, we would like to apologize for any questions that might have been unanswered because of the interest of time. But of course, as mentioned by Prof, uh, we will be more than happy to answer all the questions. You can pose the questions to us later on. And uh, of course, also we'll be sharing the, uh, the footage, the, the, the recorded version in our social media platforms. So thank you very much for your time and participation. And before we end the session, I'd like to remind again uh, the audience of another webinar series for tomorrow, where we'll be sharing on the world of pharmaceutical wonders with Faculty Pharmacy in UM, where we will be joined by Associate Professor Dr. Sniza Zamanhuri, the Dean, of the Faculty of Pharmacy, as well as the Deputy Dean, Associate Professor Dr. Najiha Mohamad Hashim. So don't miss a chance for uh, this session uh, tomorrow at the same time, two o'clock. So we'll be seeing you tomorrow for the talk on, uh, on the Faculty of Pharmacy. So once again, thank you very much to uh, Professor Dr. Yang Farida for your time, for your effort, 
and we hope that the, the students have got a lot from this sharing session and to all the students thank you very much for your time again we hope to see you here in UM hopefully in the future and uh, we wish you all the best and uh, stay safe and uh, see you again thank you very much thank you